various uh, RNAs do uh, for making proteins. And um, I mentioned on Wednesday, you know, I would say this multiple times that, you know, be prepared to answer this question. And sure enough, there'll be some people that will get it wrong. And I was not wrong. There were some people uh, that, that got the question wrong. And so um, for future reference, when we have questions like that and where it's like, you know, this, this will be really helpful, you know, to be able to do this. And, and I think for this one, uh, I told you that you could, um, you could, you could draw this, uh, this picture and, uh, and I would be, I would be pretty satisfied, uh, with it. Although some of you drew this, but didn't, didn't actually reference some of the materials. So anyways, anyways, you'll see your exam in a little bit, but we need to talk a little bit about the next part of, okay, well, if tRNAs are bringing the amino acids in and ribosomal RNA is catalyzing that reaction uh, to, to, to form those peptide bonds, well, how do we actually form these two uh, molecules? So tRNAs have a three-dimensional shape to them. It's not just a string. It's not just like mRNA, which everything is three-dimensional, but where that just stays as a long string of nucleotides, tRNAs are written in such a way that big sections of them are complementary to each other. And so they actually loop up and uh, create actually some double-stranded regions on that tRNA. Yeah? Is that similar to tertiary structure? It would be more similar to secondary structure. And then the overall would be yeah, equivalent to, to tertiary, sure. But the of like individual sections where they're complementary and they're hydrogen bonded together, that'd be the equivalent of secondary structure. And then the overall shape of it, yeah, would be equivalent, analogous to three dimensional or tertiary structure of a protein. So, and then tRNAs are charged by an enzyme that's called an amino acid tRNA synthetase. And so, synthetase means an enzyme that makes something, and in this case, it's making an amino acid tRNA a tRNA that has an amino acid attached to it. And so there is one machine for every one of the amino acids. And how many amino acids are there that are found in living organisms? 20. So there's one amino acid tRNA synthetase for each of those 20 amino acids. Now ribosomes are constructed from both ribosomal RNA and protein. Now, do you remember the region of the nucleus where our RNA is being synthesized? Do you remember what it's called? It's called the nucleolus. And it's, 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 it's obvious where that's happening in the nucleus. And the reason why it's obvious is because there you are transcribing an enormous amount of ribosomal RNA <coughs> because there are a lot of ribosomes inside of the cells. So these are what we call ribonucleoprotein particles. And uh, they basically come in two units, the small subunit and the large subunit. And there's some significance there because one of the subunits binds f first. OK, so that's a little bit about how they're formed. And you already know about what they do. What does tRNA do as far as protein synthesis is concerned? Brings in the amino acids, and it has an anti-codon to match to the codon. It does the translating. What about ribosomal RNA? It's a catalyst. It's, it catalyzes the hydrolysis of ATP and the formation of peptide bonds. Okay, The formations of peptide bonds. All right, so here is a tRNA. And this is how we tend to draw it as a cartoon, where we've got the various sections in which you are forming hydrogen bonds, where you've got some complementary uh, strings of nucleotides, where they will come in and form hydrogen bonds. And so we draw it like this, I, I guess for simplicity, that doesn't look very simple to me, because what it actually is shaped like is more like this, okay? Where you get it shaped a little bit like an upside down L, and at this end, you've got your amino acid attached, and then at this end, you've got your anticodon, a string of three nucleotides 
that will scan the mRNA. And if it matches, then it will deposit that amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. Unless, of course, it brings the first amino acid, then it's not a growing polypeptide. I guess it is. To go from zero to one is growing, right? All right. So here's this process of amino acylation or charging. Uh, charging is another name for this process. And so here you've got this amino acyl tRNA synthetase, one for each of our 20 amino acids. And we've got this amino acid that is specific to this domain on this protein. And the amino acid will come there along with ATP. Okay, it'll hydrolyze ATP and attach that now AMP onto that uh, amino acid. And then here we've got the right tRNA will come in and it'll hydrolyze the rest of that ATP. Now it's just AMP, adenosine monophosphate, hydrolyze the rest of that and create a bond between this amino acid and this tRNA. Once that it is now charged, it can leave and it can go and work in translation. And once it gives its amino acid, it has to be recharged. Okay. Again, once it gives its amino acid, it has to be recharged. Now, I was reading in preparation for my genetics class the largest protein that in the human genome. And I thought I would share that with you because I told you that DNA replication happens at about 1,000 bases a second. Uh, RNA um, writing an RNA transcription happens at about the same rate, but the largest transcript in the human genome that gets converted into a protein is 2.4 million bases long, and it takes 16 minutes to transcribe it. Isn't that cool? It takes 16 minutes to transcribe it, and I don't know how long it takes to translate it, probably a long time. Um, and it's a protein that, that basically codes for connective tissue and, and ensures that it's... Uh, assembled correctly. So here's the ribosome, here's the small subunit, and then here's the large subunit, and notice there are three sections on this large subunit. There's the E section that stands for exit or ejection site, and once a tRNA ends up in that site, it's ejected. Okay, and then here is the peptidyl site, that's where your tRNA is sitting that's physically attached to your polypeptide. And then here's your A site that stands for amino acyl site, and that's where your new tRNA comes in, bringing its new amino acid. And the, this ribosome just moves its way down the mRNA, and so every time it moves down, the tRNA moves from right to left. Okay? And so at any given time, there are usually T, T, there are usually two tRNAs physically attached to this, one in the P site and one in the A site. Okay. But it's... It's just momentary, and then you move on. Okay. Any questions about that question? Yeah, Peyton. Um, if E is the exit, why is the exit tunnel connected to P? Oh, this? Oh, it's not ejected through here. That, this, isn't, this isn't big enough for the tRNA. The tRNA is massive. That's just big enough for a single amino acid to fit through there so that you've got this chain of polypeptides sticking out through that opening. Yeah. What is the one? Amino acyl? Okay. Yeah, Micah. With charging, when you say it needs to get recharged, does that mean an amino acid has to get... Yeah, it needs a new amino acid because it gave it away in the translation process. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep, so it's got to be recharged. Every tRNA you use, you have to recharge it. And every time you recharge it, it requires a molecule of ATP. Okay, and this is, again, why every cell in your body makes and breaks 100 pounds of ATP every day. Okay, it's using it, and then it needs to rebuild it. All right. So what are the three stages of translation? What are the three stages of translation? Like transcription, translation occurs in three stages. Also like transcription, the three stages have the same names. And what were the three names for transcription, those stages? Initiation, elongation, and termination. So initiation, and just like in transcription, there are initiation factors that enable this process. And so basically, you've got your ribosome, the small subunit, grabs onto that mRNA and scans it until it finds the start codon. And the start codon is AUG.
And then all of your components assemble there. Your large ribosomal subunit comes in. Your tRNA comes in. That has the anticodon for AUG, and that tRNA brings in methionine, one of our amino acids, which means that every protein initially begins with which amino acid? Methionine. If that's the start codon, that starts the process of translation, and it also codes for methionine, every protein initially starts with which amino acid? Methionine. Now, most proteins will have sections cut off on either end before they're folded, but at least at the beginning, every protein's primary structure begins with methionine. All right. Once you reach that start codon and everything assembles, the large ribosomal subunit comes in with the tRNA with the anticodon for AUG. Now initiation is over. Okay. And then what process starts? Elongation. And elongation is aided by what we call elongation factors. Yeah. So if the start is AUG, does that mean that the tRNA has the complementary to that? that yes. For yes. Yes. So that codon is translated into methionine. And the only way that works is for the tRNA that has methionine attached to it to have an anticodon for AUG, which would be UAC. So. The ribosome, during elongation, the ribosome moves down the mRNA one codon at a time. One codon at a time. Each new codon pairs with a specific tRNA. And that specific tRNA has a specific amino acid attached to it. Now, how many different codons can we make? We did this math maybe on Wednesday, 64, right? At each site, you have four options. Four to the third power is 64. So we have 64 different codons coding for 49 different tRNAs, right? And, and then actually coding for translated into 20 different amino acids. So some codons result in the same amino acid. For instance, one of our amino acids, I think it's lysine, but don't, don't write that down. I think it's lysine has six different codons that are translated into lysine. Okay. And again, I think it's lysine, but it might not be lysine. But anyways, one of them has six different um, uh, codons that code for the same amino acid. Now, the tRNA transfers its amino acid to the peptide chain, and this reaction is catalyzed by peptidyl transferase, which is a, a riboenzyme found in ribosomal RNA. Once it's given its amino acid to that peptidyl chain, Well, actually, once it moves over into the E site, then it is ejected, okay? And so you just keep all the way through elongation, one codon at a time, one amino acid added at a time, okay? Now, elongation goes all the way until which stage? Termination. So in termination, the complex disassembles, and the reason it disassembles is because it reaches a codon that there is no tRNA for, okay? There are three of these codons. So here are three stop codons, UAG, UAA, and UGA. You know UGA, right? Did they call the bulldog at Fresno State UGA as well? Or is that just at Georgia? Because they're the University of Georgia, that makes sense. What was the dog's name at Fresno State? I should know this because I've been to a ridiculous amount of Fresno State games. My brother went to Fresno State. I don't know. So here are the three stop codons. There's no tRNA with an anticodon for this. And instead, there are proteins that are called release factors that binds that codon and destabilizes the whole complex. Because the stop, uh, release factor comes in instead of a tRNA with its amino acid, there's no amino acid to add to this growing peptide. And so the whole thing falls apart. Termination. Okay. Just like in termination of transcription, the whole complex becomes destabilizes, destabilizes, destabilized and falls apart. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So here's initiation. Your scanning. The small ribosomal subunit is attached to the mRNA and it is scanning 
for that start codon. When it finds a start codon, the rest of the complex is assembled. The large ribosomal subunit, and here you have your, uh, your tRNA attached there. And then we get elongation, moving one codon at a time. A new tRNA coming in that has an anti-codon for the codon, transfers its amino acid to this peptide, and the ribosome moves to the next position. All the way until we get to termination, and here in termination, instead of there being a tRNA to match this codon, it's a release factor. Okay, and when the release factor binds, there's basically no way to attach an amino acid here to here because there's no amino acid, and the whole complex falls apart. But notice, just to make the complex fall apart, you need to hydrolyze two molecules of GTP, which are equivalent energetically to ATP. Okay, everything falls apart. Your polypeptide is released. Your mRNA is released to be translated again. Maybe if the nucleases haven't chewed all the way through the polytail and are starting to chew it up. And your ribosomal subunits are released to, to translate another mRNA molecule. Yeah, Mika. It's guanine as the base instead of adenine. But as far as ener energetically, it's, it's equivalent. Breaking, breaking a phosphate group off of a GTP releases the same amount of energy as breaking a phosphate group off of an ATP. It's just most of, most of the cell's energy storage is as ATP and not as GTP. All right, one last question, and then we'll do our lecture breaks. I'll give you your exams, and then, then we'll just see how it goes. So what is left to make proteins? Now, first off, many uh, peptides can be made on the same mRNA at the same time. So your same mRNA, especially the one for that protein that is coded from a section of DNA 2.4 million bases long, you can have hundreds or even thousands of ribosomes translating the same piece of mRNA just at different positions. We call this a polysome, and I'll show you what this looks like. Now, on top of that, many proteins need chaperones or chaperonins, which are other proteins, to make sure they are folded correctly. That the proteins do not spontaneously fold correctly, but have to be folded correctly. Including, some of these chaperones and chaperonins have to be folded correctly by chaperones and chaperonins. Which really creates kind of an interesting dilemma in that how do you get that first functional protein? Okay, which is why there's a, a popular idea called an RNA world, where at some point in Earth's history, all information was stored and all work was done by RNAs. Okay, because you've got basically a chicken and egg problem. Like, right? what came first, the protein or the protein to fold that protein? Yes. So um, many of these proteins are assembled on free ribosomes if they function in the cytosol or the cytoskeleton. So if they are going to remain in that fluid of the cell or they're going to be maybe like kinesin, that motor protein that rocks along microtubules, or maybe they're tubulin, the protein that microtubules are made from, then they will oftentimes be translated on free ri ribosomes. Proteins that leave the cell or function somewhere in the endomembrane system those ribosomes are transported to the ER. And then most proteins that function in other organelles are made on free ribosomes as well. And the very beginning of that protein is a label, like the nuclear localization signal. Do you remember talking about that one several weeks ago? That the first part of the protein primary sequence basically folded into a label that said, take this to the nucleus. Okay. Other proteins that function in the mitochondrion um, or function in chloroplasts and plant cells, the very beginning of that protein has, bless you, has something when folded again, reads basically take this uh, to the mitochondrion. And so what is left to make proteins? Essentially, they need to be transported and they needed to be folded correctly. If they're not folded correctly, it's not a functional protein. If they're not in the right place, it's not a functional protein. A polypeptide only becomes a functional protein when it's folded correctly and it's where it's supposed to be. 
okay? So if it is a protein that functions in cell membranes, it is not a functional protein until it's where? In the cell membrane. And in order to get there, it has to go from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus and then to the plasma membrane, to the endomembrane system. So here is a uh, polysome. Here's an mRNA with several ribosomes attached and in different stages of translation at the same time. Here are some that are at the beginning points of translation. Here are some that are getting towards the end of translation. And then here is ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. And these are going to be any protein that functions where is going to need to go through this, this process and have the ribosome end up on top of the endoplasmic reticulum. What types of proteins need to go through this process? If they leave the cell, if they function in the plasma membrane, or if they function anywhere in the uh, endomembrane system, they have to go this way. Okay? If they are translated on free ribosomes, they will never end up where they are supposed to be. <coughs> The only thing we have left from chapter 15, and we will finish it up fairly quickly on Wednesday uh, before we move, we move on into talking about um, cellular respiration, uh, is we need to talk about what happens if DNA polymerase and the repair mechanism don't catch errors, and these errors persist. Okay, so what types of mutations do we have, and what does that actually mean for the organism?